All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tiffany Gallegos. I'm the Director of Operations and Program Management for FTA Region 8 in our Denver office. I've been there for 20 years. I've worked on a lot of major capital projects in Utah uh, with Utah Transit Authority. They're Front Runner North, Draper, Mid Jordan, a uh, little bit of Sugar House Streetcar, those projects. And now I work with the program side, making sure that we get all of our grants out. I work with UDOT and all of our direct recipients across the state um, to manage their grant funding with us. So um, we've pulled together unfortunately a lengthy presentation today i'm going to go really fast through a lot of these slides don't try to take notes on everything that's in there we did send a copy of this to stacy to send out to all of you if she hasn't done that already i'm hoping it'll be very soon so you'll have all these all these too many powerpoint pages at your fingertips very soon um we're going to talk about maximizing federal funding uh disclaimer and nothing in here should be construed as law. Please go read the law. Uh, this is just our interpretation to help you get things going and make sure you understand uh, where, where things are. We're going to do some updates on funding opportunities and some changes at FTA. Uh, we're going to talk about maximizing federal funding and preparing projects for federal awards. What are those things you need to do in advance to get that federal funding so that your project is ready to go? Um, then we're going to talk about Dispositions, what do you do at the end of the life of whatever it is you bought, whether it's a vehicle or a facility? We're going to focus today on the vehicles. Uh, Talbot will go through that with us because we've had some changes under the bipartisan infrastructure law. And then we have some training resources and opportunities just to remind you where to go to find more information. Uh, there's a wealth of information. Sometimes it's overwhelming. So we're trying, going to try to boil it down to help you find where you need to go. So updates at FTA, we are updating a bunch of our circulars. Uh, if you've gotten formula money from FTA before, you know we have lots of different circulars for each program source. We're trying to merge them and simplify some of our circulars. We're also doing some updates to our grant management circular 5010, and we're updating our Title VI circular. So all these circulars are out there to help interpret these requirements and rules. They will be published for you all so that you have a chance to see them before they're finalized and make comment. So keep your eye on our website. We'll, I'm sure we'll be sending out some notices to you to let you know when those are ready for your review. We recently um, put out a notice of proposed Buy America waiver, and that was open for a comment that recently closed in August. As far as I know, we don't have a decision on that yet. Cindy or Dave, have you heard? But the comment period has closed, But but keep your eye out for if that waiver comes through. And that would be for non-ADA accessible passenger vans and minivans based on non-availability. That was, that was the proposed waiver. Uh, we also have a notice of proposed rulemaking right now at the USDOT level for all the disadvantaged business enterprise programs being on highway transit and on airport concession um, opportunities. And so I have a slide a little bit later on. We'll talk a little bit more about what's going on with that proposed rulemaking. And comments are due next week. So that one is still open for comment. We, we need comments from the industry. We need to know from you how this proposed rulemaking is going to affect you, what you like or don't like, or what's missing. Any comment you have, please comment. Yes. So, for those of us that maybe have never commented, um, you know, how effective is that, or what's a good way to comment, or maybe can you just give us a brief idea of um, what we should do? Or any comment is a good comment. <laughs> Even if a comment is, yes, I love this, that's a good comment. I absolutely hate this. That's a good comment, but it needs more specificity. What do you hate? What, what is not right? Um, all of those comments go into this website on, I, I don't have the website handy right now, but um, Talbot, do you mind putting your, your ID in? It's like locking up. Um, so love it comments are good. Hate it comments are good, but be specific. Tell us what you need that's missing. Um, really, whatever you want to say. 
is, is fine. And then we have to go through all of those comments and summarize them as part of the final rulemaking that says, here's the comments we received. Here's the ones that were applicable to the issue. Here's the ones that were not quite applicable to the issue that we're saving for some other um, topic maybe. And then here's how we're addressing the comments that we received. Do you find that comments sometimes do affect the rulemaking? Yes, the yes they do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't not comment. Please comment. <laughs> Thank you, Talbot. Uh, sorry guys. There we go. Okay, do not take notes on all of this. US DOT has a lot of money out there. Like Taylor mentioned and Cindy earlier today at lunch, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of funding with the bipartisan infrastructure law. US DOT has a bunch of active funding opportunities out there. These ones in, that I've highlighted in yellow are coming due soon. So if you want to apply for these funding programs, your applications need to get in soon. The ones with stars, when I put a star next to it, those are all the programs that relate to transit. So uh, when you when you look through these and see if you have a project that fits in these programs, please apply. Rural, rural projects are high importance and we need more rural projects to apply so we can uh, award them. One of, the, one of the big programs that's out there right now is the Safe Streets and Roads for All. It is um, open until September 15th. There's two different kinds of grants. You can get one for planning Safe Streets and Roads for All and one for implementing Safe Streets and Roads for All. And there's a 20% grant um, match requirement. Announcements are expected in early 2023. There's a whole website dedicated to it. There's a bunch of resources online related to it. The idea is multimodal transportation and Safe Streets and Roads for All, pedestrians, bikes, transit, highways, all of it. So please apply through USDOT. Implementation. Well, so you could have had some planning done that met the requirement. It didn't have to be a planning grant necessarily, but it had to be a plan developed that had actions identified and what was going to happen um, in that plan. So it, it still had to meet some basic criteria, but it does not have to be a separate grant. But if, if you have a plan, but maybe it doesn't check all the boxes, and so you need to update that plan or take it a little further than it was, then you should go for a planning grant to finish that up and be in good shape for the implementation grant the next time it comes around. Reconnecting Communities is also a brand new program that we wanted to focus on um, that closes in October. It's uh, planning grants up to two million dollars or capital construction grants minimum of five million up to a hundred million um, 80 percent share for planning 50 percent share for capital reconnecting extra designations for other USDOT funding sources so if you are successful in this program it's going to give you a designation to kind of set you up for success on some other USDOT funding programs to help cover that difference because you see we have that cap of a hundred million some of these projects can be more expensive than that so this uh, designations for other funding sources is a new thing. I'm not used to seeing that very often. So take advantage of that. It might set you up for success uh, getting more funds. There's a bunch of other USDOT funding opportunities that are upcoming. A couple um, are listed on here for Chrissy, for that's rail. So that really only applies to UTA in the room. Um, but the Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Transportation Smart Grant Program should be available to all of you as well. Um, and then of course the Multimodal Projects Discretionary Grant Opportunities, all of those cover all modes of transportation. And um, a couple of them close, the two I just talked about, Safe Streets and Roads for All and Reconnecting Communities close soon. If you don't have enough grant money to cover your project and you still need your local match or you need more funding to cover some shortfalls, we do have other USDOT financing resources available through the Build America Bureau of the, um, of the USDOT. And so the Build America Bureau can help you with loans, uh, long-term loans, TIFIA program, TIFIA Light, 
uh, rural project in initiative loans, and so it's supposed to be simplified loan procedures for small projects like yours in rural areas. Um, it's supposed to simplify the process to get that funding. There's uh, there's like lower interest rates, and a, and a, I want to say 30-year loans, maybe longer than that. Um, but there's there's a bunch of loans you can get. There's also railroad rehabilitation financing that's going to lean towards UTA. And then we have um, private activity bonds and state infrastructure banks. So there's just a whole wealth of knowledge on USDOT's Build America Bureau website that talks about all these ways to get money when you don't have that money available to you yet, but you have to have some way of, most of these you'd have to have some way of paying those back over time. But that can help you cover um, some of your local match requirements. And then FTA's programs, very specific FTA program. And I am not going to go into all of these. I'm just going to give you kind of a, a bundle them together. So we've got our transit research focused programs, including AIM, EMI, and IMI. So accelerating innovative mobility, enhanced mobility innovation, and integrated mobility and innovation. All of those are very transit uh, research focused programs. Then we have our transit equity focus programs, including ICAM, the Innovative Coordinate, Coordinated Access and Mobility Grants, Areas of Persistent Poverty, and our HOPE program, Helping Obtain Prosperity for Everyone. So those are very transit equity focus programs. Then we have our transit capital focus programs, capital investment grants, bus and bus facilities, LONO, um, all of you are pretty familiar with all of those. And then our formula programs. So most of you in here will have formulas managed by UDOT. If you're a direct recipient with FTA, you'll get some of this funding from us directly. Then we have flexible funding programs. And Cindy mentioned this earlier today about flexing money from highways over to transit. There is, um, there's a whole process that you have to go through to transfer that money, but it is helpful to find other resources to help you um, pay for your projects. Yes, Dave? I still have a handful of the cards left. Excellent. Thank you. And so that's um, CMAC, STBG. Uh, we tend to see it in the larger areas, but, but if any of your projects fit these requirements, please apply for that funding. UDOT can help you transfer that, fund, that funding from highways to the transit projects. Okay. Are there any questions about that too many, too many detailed slides? Yes. They're still, like they could come out with another I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that I was calling everything out. Yeah, so I, unfortunately, I don't know. Dave or Cindy, might you know, is areas of persistent poverty replacing hope? Well, I will say that uh, a lot of our discretionary programs right now are asking for what the socioeconomic conditions are right. in the area that Right. It's really good to go into the American Community oh. Survey um, data on the census comes out and, and find out um, the information you need to fill out that part of the application. Because that, that could make a big deal of the But that's. Yeah. I don't remember every detail. That was in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, maybe that's not accurate. <laughs> okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so maximizing your federal funds. Cost sharing or matching? How many of you take advantage of cost sharing matching when you apply for federal funds? No? Okay. So this comes from 2 CFR 200, um, where you can take advantage of all the money that you're already spending using that to match the money that you're getting, so long as it's related directly related to the project that you have underway and that you have records to validate all of this. So you have to make sure that you have um, all the records need to be verifiable. They're not included as a contribution of any other federal award. It's necessary and reasonable for the accomplishment of the project or the program objectives. It's otherwise allowable, so not any unallowed costs. No alcohol, that won't be allowed. Um, it's not paid for by the federal government under another war award except where that's allowed by federal statute, which we'll get to that in a minute. And then it's a provided for in the approved budget by the awarding agency. So it's, that means it's called out as this is your source of local match. Um, so, so I have some examples of what that might be. 
the value of contributions of services and property, volunteer services, counting the value of those volunteers, third party organization furnishing services of an employee, donated property, land and equipment, anything that's donated, capturing the value of that as the match for the rest of the federal funds that you're seeking. It has to be a fair market value of those goods and it must be documented. And there's different ways that it has to be documented based on what it is. So if it's land, we're gonna require an appraisal. Um, if it's an equipment, it's gonna have to be consistent with the age and condition of that equipment, as it were, um, at the time of donation. Donated space has to be by appraisal as well, the value of that, and then loaned equipment is fair rental value as well. Sliding scale. Uh, in Utah, you have a lot of federal lands, and so you, there's um, a sliding scale that's available in Utah to use for your projects, which lowers the amount of local match that you have to put forward for your federal funds. And we've been working with UDOT directly to make sure that we can um, take advantage of the sliding scale. I believe they're researching this right now to make sure that we can actually use higher rates than the ones I have highlighted on the screen. So capital grants could be up to 89.52% of federally funded and operating grants can be 55.95%, but the numbers are actually higher if we can get um, this documentation with UDOT sorted out. So please work with UDOT if you need to reduce how much local share you have going into a project that you've applied for those funds and um, maximize the federal amount. Would you like to say anything else about that, Ivan? No? Okay. According to Council on Access and Mobility, Cindy mentioned this a little bit earlier, and this is um, established by executive order in 2004. It has a bunch of different organizations who are working together um, to, to organize all those programs that fund transportation and how those may be used to match each other's programs. Um, we have 80, let's see, how many do we have here? I'm sorry, 130 federal programs that are able to provide funding towards human service transportation. And those programs can be used to match each other in some instances. We talk about using perhaps health and human services money as maybe the 20% share of a vehicle and the FTA funds as the 80% share of the vehicle. And then you have a fully funded vehicle where you didn't have to go find any cash so long as you had two federal funding sources that were able to match each other to match each other for this for this purchase. In the braiding guide that was published, it lays out all the different fund sources and if they can be used to match each other or not. In many cases, you're gonna have DOT funds cannot match DOT funds, um, except for tribal. Uh, so tribal transportation funds can match US DOT funds. And then Health and Human Services, though, can match FTA. So we have to look into the specifics of each program. And this guide walks you through how to do that for all these different funding sources and if it's allowed or not allowed. And if it's unknown, let's say it's a new program, it walks you through a decision tree on how to figure that out. And you can always call FTA. We're happy to work with you to work that out to figure out if it is an eligible matching fund source. And there is this whole braid guide. It's like 20 pages long. It's very helpful. It's on our website. We have a link in the PowerPoint that I'm sending you. There's all these links and they should all work. Um, I did not PDF it. So hopefully it will all work for you when you click on all these links. But remember it has to, you, in order to participate in federal fund braiding, it must meet the requirements of both programs. So you still have to report to both programs, but if you're able to get one point source to match another and not have to find local match, um, that's what we're trying to do, is trying to help you meet your needs, knowing that local money is limited. Okay, so preparing projects for federal funding. There's some things you need to do to get your projects even ready to apply for all this money. Because you wanna be in the best position possible when you apply for money in order to be successful, to beat out your competition. There's a lot of competition, as we all know. And so what we're going to step through are some of the things that we want you to do to, for your projects. Keep in mind, we've thought about this from a facility standpoint more than anything else. So if you're interested in a facility, do kind of step through this with us, what to do to prepare your project for that funding. And then you can apply and hopefully be successful and uh, 
beat out all your peers. So there's different roles that the state's going to have with you than FTA, especially if you do not have a direct relationship with us normally. So I wanted to call out these, these roles. UDOT is primary point of contact for anyone who's a subrecipient. You will receive oversight and monitoring from UDOT. UDOT develops the statewide transportation improvement plan and the statewide planning research plan. The MPOs develop the transportation improvement plans and United, um, unified planning work programs. UDOT handles the civil rights programs across your state. They support the NEPA processes. They have people there who help guide us through those steps and they have technical assistance for subrecipients. They also have procurement approval processes that you have to go through. So you, if you receive your money th through the state, stay very much in lockstep with the state about what needs to be done and, is, and they're gonna help you check all those boxes to get ready for that federal funding. If you're a direct recipient with FTA, you'll work with us directly. We provide oversight of direct recipients. We approve those planning documents, steps, tips, and unified planning work programs. We, we are involved in the civil rights programs, making sure they're consistent, they meet the laws. We approve NEPA decisions. We have steps when it comes to the appraisals and validating appraisals, but we do not do procurement appra approvals. <laughs> so sometimes we'll get these emails asking us to approve a procurement. That's not our role. But if you're a subrecipient with the state, they do have a role with that. Make sure you follow their steps. Um, when we evaluate a project, we go through four primary areas, civil rights, planning, environmental, and technical. And so we're going to walk through each of these sections and what to cover under, under each of those. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Talbot to cover civil rights. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? My name is Talbot Hoffey. I'm the post award manager for UDOT, uh, Cache Valley, and St. George. I'm the person who is uh, you come to after you've received your award, manager project. So now we're going to talk about the good stuff here uh, civil rights requirements. Uh, recipients must have all required civil rights programs, DBE program, a goal, and EEO, Title VI. You subrecipients, you know, that's all going to be managed, uh, you know, through the state, DOT. Direct recipients will be with us at FTA. Um, you'll want to follow all of the uh, ADA requirements, but you're not required to submit a program about this ADA compliance. And as you can see, FTA may request material on ADA compliance at any time, but usually verifies this during the oversight process. Title VI equity analysis. This is going to deal primarily with a facility if you want to build a new building. Um, your Title VI program needs to be updated every three years, okay? And the equity analysis, if you want to build a new building, you're going to take a look at what, what are the impacts on uh, disadvantaged populations, minority and low income. You want to take a look, see if there are alternatives and pick the least discriminatory. And this applies whether it's locally funded or federally funded. Okay. And the ADA requirements for facilities, as you can see, are listed here. And um, I don't want to read everything, death by PowerPoint, everybody has suffered from that, so I'm not going to do it to you. DBE requirements, very important as well. Anybody that uh, it applies to FTA recipients receiving planning, capital, and or operating assistance who will award contracts exceeding $250,000 in FTA funds. Okay, three components of a DBE requirement. The program describes how the agency implements the program or carries out its DBE efforts. The DBO, DBE goal anticipates contracts with FTA funds and availability of DBEs to perform work on FTA assisted contracts. And then states, as you know, and direct recipients do semi annual reports to track the progress of their DBE goals. Are they reaching their goal? We've got a notice of proposed rulemaking on the DEB, DBE program. Comments are due September 19th. This again is, they're rewriting the rule. 
So if you have comments with regard to what the DB program looks like, please make them by September 19th. Okay, and in our office, our contacts are Morgan Hecht. She's our Equal Opportunity Specialist. And then with UDOT, Tori Berry, and Vicki Pollock. And I'm gonna throw it back to Tiffany. We're switching this up so nobody gets real bored. Okay, planning. Make sure we plan your projects. Get in your transportation improvement plans. Be in the plan before you start applying for these projects, um, before you start applying for these funding sources so that it shows that the project is planned and needed for your communities. Um, think about what you need in a needs analysis. Identify the functions that you need to accomplish. How, how big of a site are you gonna need? How far away is, is this site from where you need it to be? Think about if you're gonna have a lot of deadhead driving to your site if it's not located where you need it to be. You want it to be centrally located um, for your needs. Do some conceptual site planning and some high level cost estimates. Make sure your equity analysis is done before you choose your site. Um, that oftentimes we get too far down the road and then we have to back up and make sure that we have this covered. We do have some examples of that equity analysis that we can share with you. If you do need any help, let us know. We have some examples that you can follow. And it's not meant to be labor intensive. It is pretty simplified. Just give us a call if you need help um, pulling that together. We need you to identify your preferred alternative and then from all of this um, analysis that you've done of what your needs are, what you identify what you need, then we can move our way into NEPA and purchasing of property. Get a planning grant if that's what you need. There's a lot more work that goes into preparing for a project than I think sometimes people realize. Apply for planning funds, get a planning grant, help you work through those needs so that you have a clear picture of what it is that you need. It'll also help you have a clear picture of how much money is this really gonna cost. It's always a little bit mind blowing how expensive things are, um, but early on in design, you can expect that your number is probably 30% too low. <laughs> so you need to make sure that you're planning for the real cost of what this is gonna be. And just look at what's happened over the last couple of years with COVID, right? I mean, w who expected prices to raise 30 to 70% on the vehicles? But now that we know that, we're planning for it in our budgets because we can't always be waiting for more money. Um, I already kind of mentioned the deadhead thing. Make sure you're getting a site that's accessible, that's gonna meet your long-term needs, and then think about how you can phase your project. Is there maybe, uh, maybe one half the building is what you need now and then you can build on an, an addition later to meet your future needs? Think about how you can scale that, that facility to at least meet your needs now, preferably meet your needs now for the near future, but be able to be bigger, made bigger um, for your 30 year, 40 year projections basically. When we build these facilities with federal funds, we expect a facility to last 40 years, right? So we need to be thinking pretty far out in the future of what's our size needs for this. And, and is this gonna meet our needs? Are we gonna have enough office space? <laughs> When we hire, if we only build enough space for the people we have today, what happens 10 years from now when we need to hire more people and we don't have that space? Um, so think about that in your planning ahead. You need to start identifying where's your local match gonna come from for, for this facility. It's, it's pretty rare that we have 100% funding programs and we're taking advantage of those where we can, but we, we always need to make sure that we have a stream for that local funding. Um, make sure we're included in the long range plan or the stip, the tip, think about that cost escalation and um, have a budget and a project cost estimate. Make sure you include equipment and, and office furnishings in these budgets. Because oftentimes we'll see people build this beautiful building and then they don't have desks <laughs> or they don't have window coverings. And then you're just kind of piecing it together because you have no more money. Um, we want to make sure that we're planning for that in our costs so that we can ask for the money as part of the bigger ask to make sure that we have a well-functioning facility uh, when it is built. 
use use consultants where you need to this is a lot of work especially with all your day jobs you don't really need another job added on your shoulders think about how you can get support um, applying for grant funding for planning programs applying for more funding to help you work through these studies see if you can help get those experts on your team to help you work through all this and document everything that you need and make sure that your local decision makers are in the loop um, including UDOT, if you're a pass-through agency. Make sure they're at the table and they know about your project, that that project's included in those long-range plans and that, that we're working towards that funding. Make sure your equity analysis is complete. Can't say that enough times. Um, at the end of planning, you're gonna have a complete equity analysis. You're gonna have conceptual designs up to about 30% design. You're gonna have a cost estimate. And from there, you're gonna start your NEPA process. You're gonna start your environmental um, clearances. Is your plan consistent with the long range plans? Um, do you have funding for planning, design, and construction included in your plans? And before initiating NEPA, have you coordinated with FTA? please coordinate with us. 20 years ago, we didn't have as many people in Region 8 as we do now. It was a little bit harder to be ahead and, and be proactive with all your projects, but we are staffed up now and we have a great staff of environmental specialists and planners on our team and we want to work with you to help get your project in a really great position um, and be prepared, be well planned um, so that it will be successful. Like I said, after we do that initial planning, what's our needs, Where, what do we need? Not what property do we already have and how can we fit our needs on that property, but what do we need so that we make sure that either this property is good or we need a different property. Um, then we can move into environmental. When you begin planning your construction pro project, please dis discuss it with us. Discuss the description and the readiness with UDOT and FTA prior to purchasing any property before you begin final design and definitely before you begin construction. So those are all hard stops in our environmental rules. We want to make sure that you're not getting too far before an environmental decision is made. Um, FTA will provide a class of action decision early in the project planning phase. So a lot of your projects are going to be categorical exclusions. Some of them will be environmental assessments. Some of them will be environmental impact statements. Those are usually going to be big, big huge projects with UTA. Most of your projects are not going to be too bad. We want to clear your entire vision of your project. You know, that 40 year projection, how big of a site do I need? We don't want to just clear the one little addition we're doing today. We want to think about what is the full picture what is of this facility and we will clear the whole project even though you might only fund a phase or a, a scalable part of it, if it's already cleared, it's just gonna make your life easier for when more funding is needed to build the next phase. You've already got that clearance in place. It's just a matter of refreshing it. And we have to check and make sure other environmental laws have been, have been met like historic and um, a bunch of other requirements. We have a categorical worksheet with instructions at FTA. This, you're not meant to be able to read this. It's just a, a picture of the first page of our worksheet that steps you through historical and ar archeological reports, noise and vibration, wetlands, biological resources. It steps you through all the things that you need to check to clear environmental. We want in there a detailed project description that specifies what we're trying to fund and it has project maps and site plans and graphics if you have those. We ask for this worksheet to be developed anytime you're, you get a shovel and you move dirt. So if your project is just operating or buying a bus, we do not make you do this worksheet. But if your project has anything to do with moving dirt or building something, we do ask that this worksheet be filled out. And UDOT works with us to make sure that um, the subrecipients have this documentation in place as we get ready to fund those projects. We have lots of different environmental resources. Section 106 and National Historic Preservation Act, hazardous materials, noise and vibration, Section 4F for parks and recreation areas, environmental justice, and um, clean water, 
floodplains, things like that. So this, we're going to walk you through each of those that need to be covered and then how you determine that that is the correct answer. There's usually lots of online resources that we can go and check to find these answers and very quickly assess if, it, if it's going to be an impact or not. If it's not going to be an impact, we document how we determined that, we move on. If it is going to be an impact, we document how we determined that, we figure out who we need to involve, and then we move on. We don't want it to be labor intensive, but we do want to make sure that we cover all those, all those actions. At the end of the environmental, you'll get a letter from FTA that approves the NEPA clearance. So you'll know you're done when you have that worksheet all filled out and you get a letter from FTA that says, congratulations, your categorical exclusion number, blah, blah, blah. And here's your letter. This is the project that we have cleared and we reference your worksheet. And so you'll know that you're done when you have that letter in hand. And when you go and you apply for that funding and it says, what's your status with environmental? You can say, I have completed my work. <laughs> and here is all of this documentation that proves it. Um, it's helpful to have the NEPA in underway when you apply for federal funds, when you apply for those discretionary funds, either in process or complete. But definitely we want to know that um, applicants for those discretionary funds know what they're undertaking. Because if you apply for money and you don't have NEPA done, we, even though you've been selected for that money, we cannot officially sign a grant with you until NEPA is done. So then we're in a very big rush to make sure that that NEPA is done before that money expires to give it to you. And so we want to make sure that we're well underway with NEPA and communicate with us early and often. We have several contract contacts in our FT regional office. Tracy McDonald is our director of planning and program development. Robin Coolis is our environmental protection specialist. They are great. They're going to be able to walk you through all of this very simply and explain to you what we need and help you um, work through the level of detail that we need. Peter Hadley is a new community planner in Region 8. He will be assigned to some direct recipients. We just wanted to make sure that you had his name and contact information if you work with us directly. And from there, we're going to move into technical. And I'll hand it back over to Talbot. Technical readiness. Of course, we need to look at scope, cost estimate, and schedule. This triangle kind of shows the three sides that you need to have in mind when you, for your technical readiness. These are important considerations, inflation, contingency, and change management. Uniform relocation and real property acquisition policies, or the Uniform Act. Okay, as you can see, this is important. Well, what's more important is failure to comply with provisions of the Uniform Act will result in the denial of federal participation and project costs. Okay, now that this is real property. No, miss one. Okay. All right, our procurement resources from the FTA circular 4221F, Appendix D. And the dark blue box at the bottom there, I think, is the most important. Subrecipients of states shall follow such policies and procedures allowed by the state when procuring property and services under federal awards. So, your subrecipients will follow what UDOT has for policies and procedures. Okay. By America. Davis-Bacon, Uniform Relocation Act, Local and State Procurement, keep all of those in mind. All right, preparing for a facility, we highly recommend that you read the FTA Construction, Manage Construction Project Management Handbook. Okay, and take some NTI courses, these are recommended. Let's go to disposition. Are there any questions before we move on? Oh, indeed. We went through a, a lot of technical stuff. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Well, we looked at trying to do some of the NTI courses, particularly project management, mm -hmm. and they're just full waiting list. Do you have any other resources to go to for that type of training? We, we keep calling NTI and telling them we need more classes. <laughs> um, 
there are a lot of project management classes you can take, like even through local universities and such, but it's not a transit focus. So if you if you want somebody to just be generally aware of how to manage projects, yes, you can get the training you need. If you're looking for very transit specific stuff, I'm only aware of um, NTI, APTA, CTAA, TRB kind of stuff. Um, we know that we need more training. One of the things that we're asking for from the regional office side is that these trainings can be hopefully recorded so that they can be more on demand and accessible at any time because we know it's just really hard to get in those classes. Um, but we can also offer to host those classes. Have you tried offering to host yet? Uh, so we can con you or, or us, but preferably you. You have better sway being a, a direct recipient. Contacting NTI and saying, I want to host a class and I want to bring it to my location, I will provide a training room and I will make sure I have this many people attending and then they open it up to other agencies to fill in the other seats. We think we're gonna try to do something with UDOT to try to host something soon, um, but even still, I'm not sure how quickly that will come. If you're in need of something, please call us, let us know so that we can make sure that we keep pushing it at our level as well. Um, but I know. Great, thanks. I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Out of all the planning, civil rights, environmental, I mean, technical. Another question that seems how nobody else wants to ask. <laughs> Come on. And, and, and again, it may be a similar type of answer, but um, so I know for some of us, we live in more rural areas, right? So DBE is a really hard thing to have a goal. Um, so sometimes we've done zero goals, but I've heard that they're kind of frowning on those. Uh, is that the case, or if you really can justify a zero goal, um, can you submit one? Because sometimes you just don't have DVDs anywhere around you. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. It does make sense. Utah's actually very rural outside of the Wasatch Front. Yeah. Dave, you want to? Up there about, the about the DVE rulemaking, yeah. can you please make a comment yeah, on the DVE rulemaking sure. yeah. about just the lack of DVEs in the industry? Sure. And maybe list the types of things. It seems like the people on the DVE registry are very much like highway centric. We need more vertical construction as well, right? Especially as the Buy America rules change and more and more materials that go into vertical construction need to meet Buy America, and then you got disadvantaged business enterprise. You just have a lot of a lot of requirements. Um, I understand. Okay. Uh, make those comments. Encourage your peers to make those comments as well. It is always greater to have more than one person say something's a problem. Um, has more weight. Um, if I could just add something. Please. One thing um, that the, this proposed rulemaking does is it changes the threshold um, of the requirement for a DBE goal from like 250,000 to over, I forget the exact number, it's like 600,000. So um, that will also um, could have a positive um, impact for uh, smaller transit agencies that don't have access, or more rural agencies that don't have access to DB firms if their project is below this proposed new threshold. Yeah. yeah but when somebody's building a facility, a lot of times they find themselves going from the basic DBE program to have, having to have a, you know, crossing that threshold. Yes. And having to go through the whole process and then when that project's done, they're below the threshold again. So it's, it's a little bit of yeah. a... Yeah, it's a learning curve as of, you ramp up. Sure. Yeah. Um, I do know that the, the DBE and the um, Title VI contacts that we have for UDOT on that one slide, Tori Berry and Vicki Paula, I know they're very much getting engaged in transit <coughs> projects right now and they're looking for how they can provide some better training as well to all of you how they can get engaged more with all of you, please reach out to them. Let them know what your needs are. See how they can help with the uh, race neutral 
methods of trying to find more DBE participation. And it is on them as a, if they're passing through money. Not you, you have to handle it directly with us. But all these other people in the room who are subrecipients, the, the state is handling that reporting side. So they need to be very much in the loop on it. Um, yeah, please, please comment. By September 19th. <laughs> yeah, they will shut off the comments, so don't want you to be late. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What's the DBE? Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. So it's the encouraging encouragement of leveling the playing field for those smaller businesses to participate in these federally funded projects. No one else? Okay. On to disposition. Okay, thanks, Tiffany. Okay, bipartisan infrastructure law. That's the new buzz out here. Deals with real property and equipment and supplies and what we're gonna do or you're gonna do when you age out on these. Disposition, this is the definition. We're gonna focus on the two starred ones, uh, equipment and proceeds because uh, real property is an animal by itself and we don't see a lot of dispositions with real property. More likely you're going to be doing something with um, selling your mild outer aged out buses, useful life, met, met the end of useful life on your vehicles, okay? So for equipment and supplies, equipment that's met its useful life, or equipment that's been withdrawn from service before end of useful life. Okay, please keep in mind, even if useful life has been met, FTA retains an interest, financial interest in the equipment with a unit value exceeding $5,000 and supplies with an aggregate value that exceeds $5,000. Okay, here's an example of what we have, as you can see here, agency wants to get rid of a 2013 Chevy Turtle Top bus. This is the information we're gonna be looking for, well, we, the FTA will need to see on a particular asset that an agency wants to liquidate. We need to see the, um, the VIN number, who holds the title, where the, how was it funded, what was the federal share, cost of the asset, how much was federal? When did you get it? When did you put it in revenue service? What was its minimum useful life? The date you pulled it out of service? What was the mileage at, when you pulled it out of service and disposition? What date did you get rid of it? And how much did you receive? Okay. With the new bipartisan infrastructure law, we have new requirements of what you do with the proceeds. If you remember before, it was uh, set it aside. You could use it, the proceeds for a future asset purchases to lower the cost of that asset. Okay. With um, bipartisan infrastructure law, when you liquidate an asset with a value over 5,000, you can retain 5,000 plus a percentage of the local share, and we'll have an example coming up of how that works. Okay. But the rest of it must be returned. The, the, correct, the rest must be returned. So, and here's, here's that example, applying bill to disposition rule example. Okay, has the useful life been met in age or miles? Check, was the vehicle sold for more than 5,000? Yes. How much did you get? 10,000, let's say, and you can take uh, 500 for selling and handling, or 10%, whichever is less, according to 2 CFR 200.313. So 10 grand minus 500 is $9,500. The first 5,000 is retained by the grantee, okay, leaving an amount of 4,500. Then you multiply that by the federal share in the cost of the asset. You see it becomes $3,600. And 20% times the 4,500 is 900. 
grantee ret returns 3600 to FTA. Pretty simple math. Okay, what do you do with the FTA's share of the proceeds? You contact our friends at UDOT and direct recipients, you contact us. Federal share return to the FTA through pay.gov. And there is a page in the ECHO web user manual. And again, on the copy of this that you'll be receiving, hopefully from uh, Stacy, these hyperlinks will still be there. And you can simply go there for this information. Click on it. Okay. Sorry, yes, no, please. So if you, so that scenario is if you sell the vehicle. Yes. After it's useful life. If you don't sell the vehicle, after it's useful life, the FTA still using it. You still use it? FTA still retains an interest as long as you keep using it. As long as you keep using it, yes. Yes. How do you de determine the useful, uh, the HESMA its use on mileage, the full mileage? Depending on the type of vehicle there, the FTA has already set um, useful if it's a minivan, or likely it's, uh, is it five, four years, five, four one years hundred thousand. A lot of times that will be documented in your pass through agreement with the state, should be documented in your agreement yeah. with the well, state. In, the, in our state management plan. Yeah, in, the, in your, state management, and your state management plan. Direct recipients, we try to capture that in the grant directly, what's the useful life of the things we're buying, so that we have an agreement up front, what we think the minimum life will be. And FTA's minimum useful life is in terms of what do we expect minimums to be before you can get more federal funds to replace it? It's not that it can't keep working. We know some of you drive the wheels off your buses and keep them for a very long time. That's okay. We still have federal interest in it. Keep doing that. But when it comes to asking for money to replace it, we want to make sure you've met a minimum age. Yes, young lady. It is in the in our contracts that we have okay. agencies because we, we reference the useful life benchmark for perfect college, whichever you know there yeah. they have to initial that they acknowledged that. Yeah. And it references, you know, the guidelines on that. Yeah. So. And then can you go back to the slide before where it says, you know, the federal share must be paid. Nope, next one. Uh, number two, that it must be returned to you FTA. Right. You've got pay.gov and cut check. Does that mean there's two ways. You can okay. either cut us a check and mail it, and there's an address in Circular 5010 that you can pay it to, or you do pay.gov. Our preference is pay.gov. Okay. Which is an e would then be an EFT. Yeah, because we've got a right now okay. with that, and I just need to discuss Right. That. Yeah. Um, Call us. We're, we're all happy. Process, but with, with them sending us a check, but I saw that cut a check, well, should it go to you guys? So we're, and we've never done the pay doctor before. This is brand new to us. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's why we're bringing it up. It's new for everybody. What do you mean I need to write you a check? <laughs> or what do you mean I need to pay you? And so we're bringing it up to make sure people are aware of it. Please call us. If you're a subrecipient, please call the state. Leanne, call us. We got you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We have been working with, through you guys as we've gone through the process. Yeah. So yep. um, we're just at that last. Stage. Now you're at that step. Yeah. It's now. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. And making sure his, you know, controller needs to. Yes. How does it work with the grant? Because they asked, do we have to open the grant again? No. And I said, no. No. So anyway, okay. okay. All done. You know. And please bear with us. We're we're just starting to do this too. We're not used to handling this at, often. This is oh. all courtesy of BIL. Yeah, we're, we're so. trying to learn it too. Please be patient with us and we'll, we'll work with you. Any other questions about disposition? Well, I do want to say one thing. We are finding uh, with some other states that they have disposed of vehicles prior to BIL uh, being implemented and we're just finding out about it. If your agencies have done that um, in the past, we need to know uh, because this returning the money to the federal government because of BIL is for any asset disposed of after October 1st of 2021. Anything prior to that, BIL rules do not apply. Yeah. And a, dis a distinguishing thing, it's met its life and it's been sold. 
So what if it got in an accident and you have insurance proceeds? This does not, there are other instructions to follow when there's insurance proceeds. Basically, everything from the insurance has to go into replacement vehicle. Yeah. Otherwise, then you have to pay FTA. But we're assuming that you still need a vehicle because you need to replace the one that's been damaged. All that money is expected to go into the replacement. Um, the third one up in my rebuttal plan and, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> so with Rick going up, we might uh, remodel the new one. Maybe. I've always thought about turning one into a camper. There you go. I mean, they have some pretty awesome videos on YouTube. I bet they do. <laughs> you just got to dispose of FTA's federal interest first. Yeah, get, a, <laughs> okay. get us out of the way and you're free to go. Okay. Any questions? Um, here are the two experts you'll want to contact. Well, one expert. No, That's Tiffany. All right. Uh, and this is our last section, and we're, we're so we'll wrap it up. Very we'll wrap it up, and Tiffany will take over. These are just going to be screenshots of where to find more information. National RTAP has a great website. I just put red bubbles around a few different things that are really great. Um, a cost allocation calculator, Procurement Pro, good if you're trying to do a procurement you haven't done one before. A bunch of different toolkits, Transit Manager Toolkit, How to Find Anything Toolkit. Please use the National RTAP website. It's very helpful. There's other, um, there's a bunch of information on tribal trans transit as well. We want to make sure that we're um, including tribal in, as part of the whole rural area and that we're including tra tribal in our programs. And we have state RTAP um, information as well. Here's a whole bunch of those references that Cindy made in her presentation at lunch. Um, NCAT, RTAP, National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, the Transit Workforce Center, all of these are hyperlinked. Hopefully it can take you to all of them. There's a bunch of resources all over the place. National Transit Institute and Transportation Safety Institute are our go-tos for the training. Um, please do let us know if you're having trouble getting a training. We would be happy to pass along the information. And then U.S. Department of Transportation has created a web page called the Rural Opportunities Use Transportation for Economic Success Routes page. This is intended to be information digestible at your um, smaller rural level without getting overwhelmed by everything. It's intended to be a helpful resource. Sometimes we make so much help, it's too much help. We're just trying to help you know where to go in all of these. So. Please take a look at those slides when we, when we get that out to you and, and check them out um, when you have time. And do not hesitate to contact us in Region 8 at any time. We're happy to take your calls. Do not hesitate to contact UDOT. We talk with UDOT all the time. We'll, we'll be happy to work through any issues you all are having. Thank you so much, everybody, for putting up with our 62-page PowerPoint. Sorry, death by PowerPoint. Um, we'll, like Cindy said, we'll be here through tomorrow. I think we leave mid-afternoon tomorrow. So please find us in the hallways, ask us questions, let us know what's going on. We'd love to hear more from you. Um, and, and Dave's got some information. I'm passing up the last flex funding. Thank you. Flex funding. Yes. Ask for more money. We know we need more money still, even though there's BIL. So like, let's take it from the highways and put it into transit. Okay. Thank you everyone.